morning. Hope everybody's well and uh, those that are live streaming, we're sure glad that you're tuning in. So great to have John Sanders back uh, with us, looking healthy and uh, spry. So, way to go, John. <laughs> happy, happy anniversary, Kate. What else we got going here? Got a few things going. Well, we're in Luke chapter six. I hope you don't mind us starting on time, just uh, t- trying to trying to uh, get you out of here where you can visit with each other a little bit before the uh, Dan's uh, message. But uh, uh, did I say John six? Huh? Yeah, Luke. Yeah. Oh no, I've repaired. <laughs> The, uh, yes, we're in Luke 6, uh, and we're going to begin in the 12th verse. Uh, this is Luke's account of uh, Jesus' uh, choosing of the 12 uh, disciples who will be his apostles. And the list of their names uh, are here. There's actually four lists, you probably know, in the New Testament of those names. Matthew and Mark both uh, give the names of the, of the 12 apostles, and Luke, of course. And Luke uh, adds a fourth list in uh, the first chapter of Acts, uh, replacing Judas Iscariot with uh, Matthias, as, as you know. And so um, it was apparently important uh, that the number of apostles, uh, the number remained at 12. Uh, there's actually a, a, a entire category of biblical study concerned with the numbers uh, found in the Bible. You're familiar with some, I'm sure. One is the number for unity. Uh, three for perfection. Sometimes I want to turn this into a Socratic class, but... The, you don't seem to want that. <laughs> Probably I don't either, but uh, so three for uh, perfection. Uh, six is generally uh, thought to represent man. Six, just short of the wholeness and sense of completeness that is connected with the number seven. But 12, uh, it's obviously an important number in the Bible. Uh, The Hebrew year was divided into 12 months, so is ours. Uh, The day and the night into 12 hours each. And God gave to Jacob 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And now this, the choosing of the 12. The apostles are repeatedly uh, referred to by that that title. They are the 12. And... uh, Judas Iscariot, uh, when he's mentioned in, in, the, in the Gospels, almost invariably, uh, he is said to have been one of the 12, as if that was uh, some, something uh, remarkable. And their influence, the 12 apostles, was immensely important to the growth of the early church and one that will last for eternity because in Revelation 21:14, the wall surrounding the new Jerusalem is described as having 12 foundation stones, and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. There is such certainty attached to the number that it must be associated in the divine mind with the elective purposes of God. Whether that is something that we can conclude with uh, accuracy or not, at the very least, we must say that the number represents the importance of something specially chosen, and that's indicated in the few short verses we're about to read, which begin with Jesus spending an entire night in prayer before he chose the twelve. You look at the results, however, uh, you might justifiably be puzzled because there's nothing about them on the surface to impress very much. Uh, They were fishermen and sinners and often intemperate. They were uh, selfish and jealous of each other. Uh, They were a lot 
like you and me. And their initial importance and significance is found entirely in the fact that Jesus chose them. I've always found it curious. This is, this is real. Uh, I've always found it curious how some churches or ministries go about choosing those who will hold positions of authority, and they strategically target the brightest and the best, the, the jocks and, and the cheerleaders, the naturally charismatic leaders who they believe will attract a following through the power of their admirable attributes. And I truly don't like to be critical, and I don't mean to be uh, critical because I personally know many who have been very sincere and thoughtful in following that, that pattern, and God has greatly blessed their ministry. Uh, I'd almost say it worked. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm more, as I said, puzzled uh, because it's not how Jesus acted. And it's not how God in general has ever acted. Uh, to read through the Old Testament, as, as so many of you are doing uh, right now, uh, and observe uh, the behavior of the people that God selected to be his chosen people is to encounter weakness of character and behavior uh, that will make a person blush. It's true. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We have 12 examples before us in our text. Let's read them, beginning with verse 12. If you don't have an outline, we're only going to read verses 12 through 16. It's the choosing of the 12. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a, a traitor. Well, you notice uh, perhaps uh, how Luke was careful in the way he introduced uh, this short section of the gospel. It was at this time, he writes, uh, more literally, it happened in these days. In what days? He is about to tell us how Jesus went off to the mountain to pray. Uh, prayed all night long and then chose 12 men out of his disciples to be his apostles. But the occasion is what preceded it. And we looked at, at this uh, two weeks ago when Jesus healed the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. The scribes and the Pharisees were there uh, to witness it, and, and they reacted uh, with vicious vitriol and <clears throat> began plotting together how they might destroy him. The Lord knew it. He also knew that the Father's plan was for the proclamation of the gospel to continue ahead, even if his enemies were successful. And because of that, he intended to surround himself with a chosen group of followers whose testimony to the work he would accomplish through his own death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven would continue on afterward. Through his spirit, his work would not cease, but rather increase through their witness in service. And therefore, his choosing of the 12 was not something he entered into lightly. And therefore, he, he got away by himself to pray. We have uh, commented already about the Lord's propensity uh, to prayer. Of all the gospel writers, Luke seems to have been the most impressed by it. Uh, and here he indicates the intensity of his deep desire by describing Jesus' actions on this night. First, he went off to the mountain to pray. We don't know what mountain he went to, 
but the point is he sought the solitude of time alone with his father. He wanted no distractions, uh, but time apart in order to focus on the moment at hand. But it was not just for a moment. He spent the whole night in prayer, a single word in the original Greek, meaning to pass the entire night, used in other places of a, of a night-long vigil. In verse 13, we're told that the next day, he called for his disciples and he chose 12 of them. Uh, and the idea there is that there were many more disciples or, or followers of him than 12, but he only selected 12 out of them. And so during this night of prayer, he, he must have uh, put before his father many names uh, of other uh, disciples, many names of many disciples, and prayed over them and deliberated in prayer about them asking his father to give him wisdom and discernment to choose the exact ones for the coming mission. Remember, Jesus had come as the Son of God, fully divine, fully human, and as such, he possessed the attributes of God, including omniscience. But he had voluntarily uh, set aside the use for a period of time, as Paul uh, expresses in Philippians chapter uh, 2. He emptied himself. And so here we see him seeking to learn, as it were, the Father's will for him in making this huge uh, decision about who the apostles uh, were to be. Well, the application to us it is obvious if the Lord Jesus Christ would not venture out cavalierly and make decisions on his own, but felt the necessity to spend an entire night in communion with his heavenly Father, seeking his will, how urgent ought it to be for us as we navigate our own world and, and face the critical decisions that present themselves to us every day, every day, uh, every week, every season, we meet up uh, with critical junctures in our lives with decisions uh, to make and actions uh, to choose. And how often do we embark upon them with little consultation with the Lord, uh, with little time spent in prayer? Uh, we're too busy uh, to, to pray, uh, too preoccupied with other priorities, uh, when each day uh, prayer should be the one essential uh, priority. Dan emphasizes this uh, over and over again, and, uh, and I know you feel the same way about it. You're in complete uh, agreement. We're too busy. Uh, we just don't make the time to pray and how important it is. So there on this mountain, uh, Jesus spent the entire night in prayer. Eventually, uh, the dawn's uh, light uh, began to spread out on the horizon, and Jesus lifted himself up off the ground. A new day filled with hope and expectation had arrived, and now he was ready for it. Uh, Luke records, in that verse 13, how he then came down from the mountain and called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also named as apostles. That he chose that number 12 is often interpreted as intentionally corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, even by some that Jesus was somehow establishing through them a true and new Israel. Uh, in time, the Apostle Paul would take exception uh, to that specific idea, insisting that the emerging body of Christ known as the church was not at all a replacement for Israel, but that there was a future for ethnic Israel yet to be realized. Nevertheless, it was undoubtedly true that the number of the apostles matched the number of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
and they would be sent out as Messiah's official emissaries to the nation, to the nation of Israel. Uh, Jesus would say, uh, I've come, look, I've come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in Matthew 19, 28, he would even promise them that, uh, this is from Matthew, Matthew 19, 28, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But we have uh, two terms here in, in one sentence that I think needs uh, some delineation, some, some uh, explanation to distinguish between them. He called his disciples to him and he chose, uh, in the sense of that phrase, is that he chose out of these disciples 12 of them whom he also named as apostles. So the disciples were the broader and larger group, and out of them, Jesus chose the select 12 apostles. In the New Testament, that word uh, disciple is used to describe a learner uh, or a, a pupil. Uh, we, we use it that same way today to describe uh, someone who has been or is uh, taught uh, by someone. And there have been so many who have come through the doors of this church who will lay claim that they are a disciple of Dr. S. Lewis uh, Johnson. Uh, there are many today who will, say, who's, who will say they're a disciple of Dan Duncan. But in the first century, it, it, it signified more. It indicated a relationship that was more personal, which is why we often use the term follower to describe a disciple. Uh, during the course of his public ministry, Jesus had numerous uh, uh, disciples, uh, many disciples. We read about them in the Gospels. Uh, uh, the throngs, the Gospel writers uh, will say, the throngs were, were following him. And some uh, re remained steadfast uh, as the cost of their discipleship became apparent, but others fell away. Uh, and thus, to be, thus, thus proved to be disciples in name only. And so there was almost certainly this day, uh, coming off the mountain, there was almost certainly a mix of both of these ilk among the disciples Jesus called to him. In John chapter 2, John illustrates that with a group of people who had observed the miracles Jesus was performing and begun claiming belief in him. We read and studied this two weeks ago in, in Dan's ministry of the word uh, out of John chapter 2. And John writes in verse 24 of chapter 2 that Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man for he himself knew what was in man. And so that was certainly true, uh, uh, it's certainly the case on this day. Uh, but these 12 disciples, he distinguished by naming them apostles. Uh, the, mean, the, the word apostle means one sent out, apostello, out sent. Uh, they, they're sent out. Uh, he is one, an, an apostle, commissioned by his sender. Uh, to act in his authority and represent him in accomplishing the task he lays out. Uh, Mark actually gives a fuller description in his gospel. In Mark 3, verse 14, Jesus, he says, Jesus, Jesus appointed 12 so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. The, the first priority then was that the apostles spend time with the Lord. That's what, that's what uh, Mark says. He appointed them that they would be with him, and he sent them out to preach. And that's, that's the, the next thing, that they spend time with him and then that they would go and, and preach. The apostle was a messenger uh, sent out with the full authority of the one who had sent him. In our New Testament, uh, we know uh, the word was used 
occasionally in a less than technical sense for someone uh, commissioned for some particular uh, task. Uh, Sylvanus, Timothy, Apollos, Barnabas, uh, all are at one time or another uh, called apostles. But the more common use of the term in our Bible is the more narrow sense of the 12, uh, plus Paul eventually. And when used of those apostles, it was a description of the office that they held. This, this was a, an office. And consequently, uh, the office of the apostle ended when the last of them, most likely John, departed this earth. But after Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, and up until that time, they would serve as the official witnesses to Christ and the gospel and the leaders of this new community of faith. Uh, some of them even, as you know, became inspired writers of the books of the New Testament. And thus they were quite important to the Lord's mission. Uh, Luke explains to us that he chose them. That's a profound uh, thought. After a full night in communion with God the Father, a night as A.T. Robertson, the great New Testament scholar, observed of absolute crisis for our Lord, Jesus emerged to choose even Judas Iscariot, who would deliver him over to death on the cross. You did not choose me, Jesus would later say, but I chose you. None of the 12 had sought this assignment for themselves. As, as many have noted, this was sovereign election. And now we come to Luke's list of their names. I'm going to try to make it as rapid fire as possible. In each of the four lists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and Luke's and Acts, uh, there are some slight differences between each, uh, one from the other. But as we would expect, there is much consistency between them. If we divide the names into three groups of four, and uh, we're, ru we're rushing through this, but if you had time, you could examine it. Three groups of uh, four. Uh, the same names occur in each group in all those lists. The same name heads each of those groups of four. Simon, Philip, and James the son of Alphaeus. Although the order within the group may be a bit different in a couple of them. Won't go into that in, in detail. And the first name in all the groups is Simon. He's the first name in all four lists. Simon comes first. And here Luke joins with Matthew and Mark in reminding us that Jesus gave him his second name, Peter. This group, you know this, uh, the name meant rock or stone. And when Simon made his great testimony at Caesarea Philippi that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, uh, Jesus turned to him and said, I say that you are Peter, rock, and upon this rock I will build my ch church, except to use a slightly different word for rock in the second time that meant something like a boulder. Upon this rock, this boulder, I will build my church. So Simon was the rock, but his testimony that Jesus was the Messiah was the foundational bedrock that would be proven in the days, in the years that followed. Well, that he's listed first in all the accounts indicates the primary role he played within the group, and the, the early chapters of Luke's Acts of the Apostles bear that out as he describes Peter's boldness and leadership in the early days after the Lord's ascension. His, let's just call it, his famous uh, denial and abandonment of the Lord is highlighted in each of the Gospels. Poor guy. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all uh, record it. Uh, and John, 
uh, provides for us uh, the Lord's tender restoration of Peter to the important task that he had set before him. And, and Peter from that moment on proved to be the natural leader. And more, more importantly, perhaps, Peter became an example to generations of disciples who followed of what God can do in the strength of his Holy Spirit to make a stumbling, bumbling, imperfect person without any natural courage or even discernment into his mighty and bold servant. There's hope uh, for all of us. We find it in Peter. Andrew is next. He was Simon's brother. And we know from John's uh, gospel that it was he who first brought Simon uh, to see Jesus. So that's, that's a big deal to me uh, about Andrew. He brought Simon uh, to Jesus. Uh, they were both fishermen, brothers and, 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 and fishermen. They were both uh, disciples of John the Baptist. They were both following uh, John the Baptist. But when Andrew saw and heard John look at Jesus and say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he began to follow Jesus. And the first thing he did was find Simon and excitedly say, We have found the Messiah. That was Andrew. Well, not much is said in the Gospels about Andrew other than that. In Mark and in Acts 1, verse 13, he's named with the list, uh, but not next to Simon in those two places, but following James and John. Interestingly, the brother doesn't follow the brother. He comes later. And that, 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 that means... Um, it must have been understood at the time that James and John were the more preeminent of uh, the apostles. And Luke doesn't mention him again, except for that brief little reference in the list in Acts chapter 1. So, not all of us can be considered great, but we can be significant. Luke lists uh, James and John uh, next, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, they were a pair of fishermen uh, also. Jesus gave them another name too, Boanerges. I think that's how you pronounce it, Boanerges. Uh, it means sons of thunder. You could debate why he gave them that nickname, but uh, there's good reason to, they were fiery, uh, those two were. Along with Peter, uh, James and John had the priv privilege of uh, uh, being on the Mount of Transfiguration with uh, the Lord. That was a glorious moment for them. But then sadly, uh, at the urging of their uh, mother, uh, they got uh, caught asking for more, that they might be at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus at his coming kingdom. James was the first of the apostles to be martyred by Herod in Acts 12 too. So perhaps he did get to the right of, of the sun. He was the first, maybe he scrambled up. I'm, I'm, that's a bad joke. <laughs> he was the first to die and go be with, with Jesus. John likely was the last of the 12 to remain. Uh, John became by his own testimony the disciple whom Jesus loved. And after the crucifixion, he took Mary. Uh, the mother of Jesus, into his own home. John and Peter seem to have been especially close. You realize that, uh, you know, in the last part of John's gospel, especially in the early chapters of Acts, they were allies in ministry. Uh, they contributed a good portion of our New Testament. John, uh, writing not only his gospel, but he also gives us three epistles, and he wrote the book of Revelation, uh, Peter, we have from him his excellent sermons in the book of Acts, uh, the two epistles that are uh, found in the canon. And uh, Peter is w widely held to have been the major source behind Mark's uh, gospel. 
Philip and Bartholomew are the next pair cited. Uh, the lists do seem to catalog the apostles in pairs. Uh, Philip was at least for a while from the same city as Peter and Andrew, Bethsaida, uh, John 1, 44. <clears throat> Jesus had traveled into Galilee in, in John 1 and found Philip, that's what John says. Jesus was always finding uh, people like that. Uh, and Philip began following after him. Then Philip went and found Nathanael, uh, excitedly telling him that we have found him of whom Moses and the prophets spoke, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, to which Nathanael replied, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. And later he, it, he did indeed go and see Jesus. And Jesus memorably uh, said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Uh, leading to Nathanael's great confession, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of, of Israel. Uh, Philip was always around. He was handy. Uh, it was to Philip that Jesus went uh, at the feeding of the 5,000. What's the food situation uh, here? That, that, that was Philip. When the Greeks in John chapter 12 uh, came, they, they would see Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus. They went to Philip. Uh, Philip took Andrew with him, uh, went and told the Lord what they were to discover was monumental news that the Greeks wanted to meet with him. As for Bartholomew, uh, the apostle paired with Philip, we find no other mention of Bartholomew uh, by that name, and that has led most to conclude that Bartholo Bar Bartholomew was in fact the second name for Nathaniel. Uh, that was a common custom. Uh, see Levi slash Matthew, or for that matter, see Simon slash uh, Peter. If that's true, then Bartholomew was the apostle about whom Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And it was Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, who then made that great confession. The next pair are Matthew and Thomas. Matthew, we were introduced to just a few verses uh, back. He was the hated tax collector who... Uh, left all his wealth behind, left everything behind to go and follow Jesus. And then he held a great feast uh, to bring all his rowdy friends in. And uh, much, to the, uh, uh, much, much to the chagrin of the, the scribes and, and Pharisees. Thomas is the doubting Thomas of John chapter 20, who was absent when the risen Lord uh, met with the other apostles and, and then simply could not believe that he was alive. Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, he protested, and, and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Uh, Thomas so wanted the other disciples' words to be true, he wouldn't allow himself the possibility of disappointment. But Jesus was merciful to him, and after Thomas had himself actually seen the risen Christ, he responded, my Lord and my God. About James, the son of Alphaeus, we know almost nothing. In, in Mark 15, verse 40, there is a James that Mark mentions standing there around the cross with the women that were around the cross. He mentions a James. Um, He's called by Mark James the less, uh, either because of stature or perhaps age or perhaps to distinguish him from the other uh, Apostle James. If they are the same person, this James and James the less, then his mother was the Mary that was frequently with the Lord and the other women and who was at the cross. Uh, a second Simon is named next. Uh, Luke says he was called the Zealot. That may have been uh, meant that he was especially zealous, or it may have indicated that he had been a member of a radical nationalistic party later known as the Zealots. Either one of those is possible. Then comes Judas, the son of James. He is known by Thaddeus, uh, by Matthew and Mark, uh, who both list his name in the order uh, prior to Simon 
uh, the zealot, and Luke may have slid his name down in the list in order to couple the two Judases uh, together. In John 14, 22, during Jesus' upper room discourse, John makes note of a question that this Judas asked, uh, referring to him there as Judas, not Iscariot. Uh, his question there indicates some disappointment on his part that Jesus was not actually bringing in a visible, physical uh, kingdom. And then lastly, there is Judas Iscariot who became a, a traitor. Uh, the name has traditionally thought to be interpreted as Judas the man from Kerioth, a, a place in southern Judah, and that would have made him the only uh, apostle, uh, the only one of the 12 from Judea. The others were all uh, Galileans. Uh, reading between the lines, we, we might discern a subtle suggestion that the Judean in the group was on the more sophisticated sophisticated side of things than the country boys from Galilee. We'll have more to say about, Lord willing, uh, about Judas Iscariot, uh, but it should be noted that Luke states he became a traitor. He, uh, to the other apostles at this time, Judas was above reproach, and he would remain that way to the end. He was the devil's infiltrator inserted to work the devil's evil designs. But when in one of the great plot twists of all time, uh, the devil himself was on the Lord's assignment. So Luke has now set the stage for all that has transpired uh, since the Lord's choosing of the 12. Uh, much later, in the 17th chapter of Luke's uh, book of uh, Acts, in the midst of describing Paul's second missionary journey, uh, while he was preaching the gospel in Thessalonica, uh, Luke describes this belligerent uh, Jewish mob on a rampage to try to find the apostle and, and the Christians and, and, and attack them, but basically to kill them. And, the, the, the mob complains to the city authorities. This is what they shouted. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. They did. They turned the world upside down. In, in, in one way of putting it, they dragged you and me here this morning. Who were these men? Well, we've just described them as best as we can in the time that we have. None of them had credentials or possessed the kind of intellect or, or talent that could have predicted their success. It's true that in some sense we can look back and consider them outstanding characters of history. But when Jesus chose them, uh, they were simply ordinary men uh, doing ordinary things in the course of their very ordinary lives. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Jesus elected 12 apostles. He elected 12 apostles. It was a different expression of the election of God of the great company of the saved, but it was election nonetheless. And the love that is behind the sovereign election of God of undeserving sinners to salvation is the same love that chose these ordinary 12 apostles. At the end of his earthly life, in the Lord's high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus prayed, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name which you have given me and I guarded them and not one of them perished but the son of perdition so that the scripture would be fulfilled. 
so we begin. When day came, he called his disciples to him, and he elected out of them twelve, whom he also named apostles. Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve. Jesus lovingly elected Judas Iscariot to come into his inner circle. Uh, Judas, whose mission it would be to deliver him over to those who would kill him in the painful death on the cross. Was it not necessary? He would later say to those disciples on the road to Emmaus, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? God's necessity and God's love for his people are two sides of the same coin. The world may not understand it. They don't understand it. They may scoff at it. But those of us who have felt the warmth of the love of God can only give thanks, uh, worship, and respond in service uh, to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this faithful group. Uh, what blessing they had to be called and elected by the Lord Jesus Christ to serve him as apostles. And thank you, Lord, uh, that our Savior chose Judas so that he might go to the cross and die for us and save us from our sins and bring us into this beautiful relationship that we have with you. May we be like these apostles in our weakness, uh, going and finding others, uh, proclaiming the good news, rejoicing that we too have been found by the Messiah. We pray in his name, amen.